Hi, friend. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. So uh, I've really loved your writing for a while, and of course, we're friends as well, and just really happy to be talking with you and diving deeper into some of the things that you've written about. Um, Likewise. I wondered to start, could you share a bit about your background and your life story and, you know, uh, that sort of thing? Yeah, um, I'll go over it briefly and we can dive into anything um, that you want to hear more about. So I grew up in India and I lived there for uh, the first 17 years of my life. Um, and then I moved to the US by myself uh, for college. I'd never been outside the country before I moved here. Um, my mom came with me, but she was here for like three days and then she left. Uh, so it was mostly just me figuring things out by myself. Um, and I've been here now for almost a decade uh, and learned a lot in the process. Um, uh, I studied software engineering in college and that's my day job now. Um, I really enjoy it. I, um, it challenges me intellectually in a way that that's different than writing. Um, and I really enjoy the challenge. Um, and um, along the way, like, I went through college and I worked uh, in a couple of different places, including a few different continents, including Europe. And um, I started a few companies that didn't work out, uh, but they worked out in terms of getting me a lot of experience. Um, and I learned a lot from actually getting my hands dirty and doing the things. Um, and yeah, now I write and I have a day job and I'm figuring stuff out, a lot of which we'll be talking about today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, what, what was it like for you to move to America from India at 18? Um, so uh, some context is that uh, I grew up speaking English, so the language wasn't a challenge. Um, and I grew up watching a lot of uh, uh, American sitcoms and TV uh, movies. And so it was um, not fully unexpected, but yeah, like life is different than what they show in the movies. Um, so the, um, it was like difficult in some ways and really liberating in some others. Um, I, it was, it, it, was, it was actually really liberating to start over, uh, I'll say that. So I felt like it was a really fresh start and I could be whoever I wanted. So I really did use the first few years here to like analyze um, what I was doing and become really aware of who I was as a person and who I wanted to be, which I think a lot of people do in college anyway, but I had sort of like a extra clean slate because I didn't have any background here. Um, and it was really difficult because um, I didn't necessarily get a lot of emotional support from my family. Like um, since I had always been pretty self-sufficient, um, they expected me to figure it out by myself. And uh, I was able to in the end, um, but it was pretty taxing to like, um, be figuring a lot of stuff out, but, and also not really have um, anybody to really talk through things with. Um, yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Was there anything that surprised you about American culture? Um, I think something that surprised me was that there wasn't a lot of knowledge about other countries uh, that like people that I knew like I mostly interacted with college kids that were my age um but uh, a lot of people that I knew hadn't really weren't really aware of uh cultures of other countries like I was aware of the American culture growing up um and yeah um that was that was kind of surprising mm. I guess I didn't expect that mm. was there anything that you found yourself really missing about the Indian culture of your childhood no, that's a, um, yeah, I got that question a lot. Like a lot of people, well, I think it's common for international people that come in, international students to um, 
really miss home and try to like band together with other people from their home country or other international students just because they're like living the same experience but I I honestly didn't feel like that I just felt very liberated like um I think the way I would describe it is that I felt more like myself than I ever had in my life um and so I think I really knew that I was just gonna stay it was this was it for me I, I wasn't gonna go back um and uh I've, I often describe it as like, I grew up on the plane. Like I remember it was like a very long plane ride. And then when I got uh, to the US, I was like, I cried a lot the first day. And I was like, that's it. I'm, this is it. I'm here now. Like I'm accepting my reality and I'm just gonna roll with it. And um, that I feel like is still one of my strengths is to be really like, no matter how hard it is, um, to really see what is in front of you and acknowledge that to be the truth. I definitely feel like I am able to do that and accept it and live in it. And that really, you know, enables you to change it, um, and change yourself, uh, because you're actually working with what's real instead of like some imagined version of reality. Mm -hmm. That is a really strong superpower to have. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, uh, well, how has, how has writing played a role in your life, uh, like historically? Yeah, that's, yeah. Um, it's been, it's been omnipresent. I feel like I, I don't remember a time when I wasn't writing. Um, and I think I learned language and I learned to read like pretty early on. Um, and I don't have any metrics for this, except I remember when I was little, like earliest memories from like three or four years old, I've just been like really into books. And um, I've always just been very naturally drawn to writing about my experience. Um, it's, well, on like, a, if we if we like start at the very surface level of it, it's like a nice way to record memories to like remember, to like remember your life um, and remember your experience of it and um, from the inside. So like lots of, um, so photos and videos are like an outside perspective on your life versus writing is like what you felt from the inside, living it, living through the things that you, that you did. And um, yeah, so I've been, writing for as long as I can remember and I like it as a way to just like record how I'm feeling and also like release a lot of stuff from my body like if I can't figure things out if it feels too heavy or um sometimes and this is funny but sometimes I feel like um uh the ideas are sort of sitting on top of the gears that process them and so the gears can't really move unless you get the ideas out so like I write all the things that I I'm thinking about like stream of consciousness and then I can really start processing them. Then I can really start, then the gears can start moving because there's nothing like stopping them, uh, nothing holding them down. And uh, I don't know, I've really always used writing to like clarify my own thinking, like figure out what, what, what do I feel? Like, how, how do I, I mean, it's, I think, I don't know where this saying it's from, but uh, it's like, if you want to know how you feel, create something. Or if you want to know where your energy is like, create something. And then you'll see it out there and you'll be like, whoa, all right. Like that's what I'm projecting or that's what I'm feeling. Um, and writing has always been that for me. Um, also, I'll say that I've always been very bold with my writing. Like I've always written about really intense like deep stuff and again this goes hand in hand with like accepting reality and not being afraid of it really um and so i've just been very uh comfortable doing that for some reason and other people around me have not always uh had i think the emotional capacity to receive that so for example i uh wrote an essay when i was 16 or 17 um, and it was called Tequila Sunrise and it was about a woman a young girl who was standing on the edge of a cliff in um, an open forest and uh, there was an empty bottle of tequila next to her and it was 
it starts out at midnight and it goes all through the night and uh, just what she's thinking about and how she's feeling. And then it's basically about her deciding whether or not to jump off the cliff. Um, and then uh, the morning comes and it's sunrise and we don't know what she chooses. And um, I remember my mom was very, freaked out by that like I, I showed it to her and I was like all proud like 16 year old writing about um interesting things and she was like whoa like are you contemplating are you contemplating suicide um and I that never even really crossed my mind for me it was just like an intellectual exercise just like a I don't know like a fictional expression of my experience like I think I was feeling a lot of turmoil and growing up and people's uh, expectations of me were changing and and um I just felt like I needed to write about that and um I don't think uh that really was how it was received um and I think for a long time that really scared me like that reaction that my mom had to like because, I, and I thought that there was something wrong with me, like I was being really intense or, and then, and then it really, and we'll get into this later, but uh, because I had very poor boundaries at the time, it really made me question myself. I was like, wait, was I thinking about, do like, was I thinking about uh, suicide? Like, was I, um, like, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure now because maybe my mom's right. And um, so it really got in my head. And then for a long time, I didn't write. Uh, so for the first, like, I think I would say five years um, that I spent in the US, I basically, I mean, I wrote a little bit, like I journaled a little bit, but it felt very, I remember feeling very inauthentic and like coming from like a very, uh, not coming from like a really deep place, like not really coming from inside me, but just sort of like, me trying to be what other people I thought other people wanted me to be and um for a lot and so then I didn't really write because it was it didn't really feel authentic um and uh and then sort of last year I sort of I mean I I'd been writing and then after the first five years I started writing again like slowly and then uh last year I sort of really made this a lady on fire uh, account and uh, really started actually putting a lot of effort into my writing and um, because it just felt like I could not I, I could not do it, it like I it was just flowing out of me. I could not put it down and put it out there and um, uh, and then again like this year earlier this year uh, it got a lot of positive feedback and a lot of people like started reading it and then I got confused again I was like oh am I writing because they want to read what I'm writing or am I writing because I want to I have something to say um and uh I think the resolution that I've sort of now come to is that both of those things are true um and uh that's kind of what the next essay is about uh and so it's like a little sneak peek um yeah if you have any questions um but I i'm happy to talk about any part of this mm -hmm. a lot more mm -hmm. um i'd be curious to hear how you would describe the sort of genre that you've found yourself writing this with your lady on fire substack yeah that's um uh existential nonfiction. Mm. <laughs> it's like it's like really deep, like introspective. Um uh and I don't know how to um like I think it changes me as I write it, which is why I really enjoy it. And I think it changes the people that read uh yeah, it changes the people that are reading it. So um also yeah i don't know it's like a world view shaping for me and for the readers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Are there any writers that you like and look up to that have written similar things? Not that I can think of off the top of my head. Um, I, there are definitely writers that I like and look up to. People that have written similar things, I don't think I've found, I don't, I don't think I've found anyone that writes something uh, quite like, quite like I do. Mm -hmm. Although I will say that in general, I really like the genre of like memoir and people writing about their life uh, from a very deep introspective place where they are not just relating events, but they're also really saying how they felt about them and how it changed them and who they were before and after. And uh, yeah, and I think just reading about that really changes me as well. Um, I So my favorite book is Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality. And um, I've actually met the author of that book, Eliezer Yudkowsky, and it was very surreal. Um, and that that actually I do want to mention as one of the things that I really love about books and writing uh, is this like, <sighs> I don't know, it's a shared intellectual exchange, this like feeling like you are inside somebody else's brain and experience and in a way that you never really can be from watching movies. I mean, this is why I really also like Twitter uh, to as a way to get to know people because when you meet people in real life, it's like you're watching a movie about their life, like you're watching a curated, very short, um version of their experience and uh it takes a little while like if you if you think about it when you watch a movie or uh, watch a tv show it takes a little while to get into the character's head because they're not like talking their thoughts out loud the whole time whereas with twitter it's the opposite it's like reading a book about somebody's life and you are listening to their internal monologue as far as i think um uh, this part of twitter um goes people are just talking about the things that they're thinking about. And it's like reading a book about somebody else's life. And you feel such a strong connection when you actually meet them because you know them better or it feels like you know them better. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Hmm. Are there any other writers that you like uh, besides Yudkowsky? Um. So I'm reading Douglas Hofstadter right now, Godel Escherbach. And, um, I really like, I really like that. Like this sort of like, um, uh, this idea of like infinite loops or like infinite recursion is very, I don't know, it just like touches something really deep inside me. It's like very, um, I mean, I, I feel like viscerally, like that is my experience. Um, and, yeah, I really like um, people that make me feel things, uh, people that make me like uh, learn things about myself and feel things. And uh, because it also helps me to identify like who I am. And um, I, we can we can get into that more if you're interested. But other writers that I like, I actually really liked Obama's book. Uh, a Promised Land. I really love the name uh, of that book. And also like his experience was very much like uh, writing about his life in the style of a memoir, but also very deep intellectual conversations. Like there's just paragraphs of just questions. Like, like, why is this happening? I don't understand how to solve this without any answers. And I feel like that is the real human experience. It's just like more and more and more questions with no answers. And mm. sort of your quest of life is to find the answers to the questions mm. that you care about. And uh, yeah, so I really like that book. Uh, I don't know. To be honest, I don't really remember uh, on the level of memory a lot of uh, the love of conscious memory a lot of writers that I read but I do remember on the level of subconscious feeling what they made me feel and I feel like that 
that really just stays with me. Uh, and it, and yeah, in some ways, like my writing is like an amalgamation of all the writers that I've ever read. And like my personality is an amalgamation of all the people um, that I've absorbed wisdom from and chosen to keep it. Uh, and I don't remember specifically who that is, but I do remember how they make me feel. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm. That makes sense. Yeah, definitely. What is your writing process like as you write the essays that you've been sharing? Yeah. Um, yeah. So we'll talk about it on like the mechanical level and then on, on like the um, internal level as well. So the mechanical level, I really just like to write on like a clean uh, sheet of paper. So first of all, I write on my laptop, uh, not by hand. I think really fast and my hand always gets really tired if I actually try to write on paper, uh, but I can type really fast. So uh, it's easy to, it's easy to get my thoughts out there. So yeah, I just like to write on, I just use pages, uh, the app that Mac comes with and there's like a way to just make it like distraction free mode and I just put um yeah and so yeah so that's like I think and then and then also I write sort of in two stages so I write like there's a writing stage and the editing stage I'm not like editing as I'm writing I have done that before but then like I never really end up finishing those essays because they're just like forever in the processing uh stage so um, I've separated those out. So I write first and I edit later. And then um, intellectually or like, uh, I really like to write um, sitting in like a corner of my couch. And it's like the couch corner and there's like me in the middle because I feel like the couch is hugging me and it feels really safe in there. Um, and so I really feel like um, finding like a physically safe space is very, uh, has been very good for my writing process. And, um, and then I, I don't like to get interrupted, like when I'm writing and I can just write for like many hours on end. And, um, and I just write till I feel empty. So basically I start with an empty piece of paper in a safe space. And then I just start talking, uh, to myself. Uh, sometimes it's just like, stream of consciousness sometimes just one person talking sometimes it's many people talking and if it's many people I just write what everybody is saying like dialogue in a movie like this part is like oh hello and this part's like no I don't like you and then yep everyone everyone just gets it's like a safe space for everybody in my head and so everybody gets a, gets a voice and um and I just put it all out there till I feel like uh there's nothing left to say. And often I start with a prompt, like I start thinking about something and then I write with that. And I have like a, I have a running folder in my notes uh, on my phone for just like ideas, uh, just like things. And I, and these ideas come at the most random times, but I just write them down real quick. Cause I want to remember it later to put into an essay. And um, yeah, I just write, I, and so I start with a prompt and I read whatever notes I had at the beginning. And then I just write on the empty piece of paper, like whatever I'm feeling. And really it comes from a place of like, where do I feel it in my body? What does she want to say? What is she feeling? And um, often I do something, this is like a therapy technique, but uh, well, both of these are like somatic experiencing like wh where do you feel things in your body is like a therapy technique but also um, brain spotting is another uh, technique where you try to like think of a memory and you try to get into it and then you sort of um, look at different spots in your eye line above and below like um, if you're just staring over there to your left on the level of your eye line or above or below or like the middle or right above or below and then you pick the one that that like sort of allows you to get into that memory and you'll know like if you try it you'll know and then I just sort of like I just sort of like use that as like a way to get into the feeling and then I just write about it um and this is um I will say that this is uh I learned this technique in therapy with uh, 
somebody like with a therapist there uh, helping me process things. And um, it's best to start out that way, I feel like with somebody else, just because um, you may not, you may not like, like the things that come up. And uh, if you feel overwhelmed by them, then it's nice to have someone else there to help you out. But I feel like I can, um, I really do feel like I'm in control. And I do feel like I can bring myself back if I need to. And, um, but I do really get into it, uh, into my body and into, into the memories. And then, um, and then uh, I just, yeah, I just write till I feel empty. And then I read it. Like, sometimes I feel like I can edit right away. And so I do that. But sometimes it's, doesn't happen the same day it's like different days and then I just like um read whatever I've written and that is uh sometimes quite intense because I'm not even like the whole time aware so to speak of what I'm writing like I'm just sort of because you know um it's like that experience when uh like if you drive down the same route every day like sometimes you just arrive at your destination and you don't remember how you got there like today because you were just thinking about something else the whole time essentially and so that's sometimes what it feels like with the writing is I'm not even fully there I'm just sort of in the past processing the memory and then uh and then when I go back and read it I'm like whoa that was really wow she was feeling a lot there um and then at this stage I really try to hold myself in a loving embrace uh and just like really accept whatever whatever is there like whatever has been written and um and uh and then uh I have this like so I have this very like creative uh brain that's like really in touch with my body and my feelings and my memories my subconscious and then I also have this like a very organizational like executive function like break things down what are the patterns and all these different spaces and match them up sort of brain and then that's really what I use to edit um and so when I read the things that I've written I'm like oh I like immediately start seeing like oh here's the structure here's like the here's like the five like sections and um here here's what um uh here's I'm gonna break it down and um, often, like, I start with the structure, and then it doesn't work, and then I uh, uh, rework it, and then try to do, try to, like, play around with it some more, and, um, yeah, and then I just, like, sort of keep going until I find, like, a coherent, like, uh, <laughs> I sort of keep going until the thing that I have is, like, a real punch to the gut, uh, is how, like, reading it makes me feel like, whoa like that is intense like that um really makes me feel something and so if some it makes me feel a lot and so i'm sure it, it will make other people feel at least a little bit and if they have the same experiences or similar like experiences that made them feel similarly then they'll feel a lot too um and so that's really the goal of, of every like piece is to really make me feel something and make you the reader feel something um and then the last thing I'll say is that I don't, that I have tried writing, um, uh, like I have tried like thinking of the structure first or thinking of the idea first or thinking of the conclusion first, but I, that's really the goal of writing. Like that has never really worked out for me. Like the goal of writing is to uh, see what comes up, like dive into the unknown and then see what you find see what you find about yourself about your past about other people um and then really be open to it and then that's i find that's like the best writing for me is where i where i'm like exploring instead of uh defining like in, instead of like having a predefined conclusion of like what's this gonna end up being like it's like a real like exploration into like a deep dive into myself uh, and and finding whatever comes up. Yeah. What makes you really proud of a piece when you like think back about the pieces that you've published? What what sort of sticks out of uh, as a quality that makes you particularly proud of something? If it makes someone cry, mm. 
like basically I think that's like um yeah like often um I uh show my pieces to my partner and uh like if he reads it and he's just in tears by the end of it that's <laughs> that's a win um and and other people have reached out and told me that it really made them cry. They like went back to it and learned more from it uh, over time. And that makes me really, and okay. And let me also, these are like external outcomes. Like these are things that like, I won't know till I've written and other people have read it and then told me that they feel this way. Um, but what, what makes me really proud of it is if it changes me, like if I feel like it changed me, um, and also if it makes me feel something like if I read that and it's like a really visceral like it makes me feel alive like it ignites something in me and that is really what I think I'm chasing with every essay mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's funny that you mentioned I think you mentioned earlier like oh someone if they've been through the same experiences uh like it will really resonate and I I totally imagine that and when I read your essays, it's like, oh, I, I really haven't been through the experiences you've been through. And yeah, it's it's almost like, um, yeah, I mean, I think reading does this generally, but certainly very strongly with your writing of like transporting you into your world and what it's been like to be you. And like, oh, that's that's a very intense uh, experience. And I feel like your writing really uh, lends itself to that delivering that Thank kind of you. experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's actually a good point. I received this feedback in the past as well. I'm very descriptive as a writer. So you can like transporting myself into transporting yourself into my world is very much the setting up the context is very important to me. Because mm -hmm. uh, I feel like a lot of okay, this is why I don't have a, a lot of examples of this kind of writing. To be honest, I don't really I'll talk about them separately. But um, I feel like a lot of people that write similar existential nonfiction, um, I haven't found that many people that set up a lot of context and um, in like a quick way, like not a very, very long contextual, like here's the entire story of my life. No, like what's like the, like the smallest, like tightest way that you can support this narrative with the context of your life. So I feel like I'm part of your world. Um, so I feel like I'm living inside your life. And then when you talk about the realizations that that uh, you came up with, I'm like, whoa, yeah, like if I was that person and I went through that and I realized this, like it would be huge for me. Um, and then also I was going to say, secondly, I don't think I've like particularly done a lot of research into other writers that write similar things, um, mostly because uh, I feel like I don't have the greatest boundaries yet around that. And if I go into it um, without really knowing my limits, then I might subconsciously take on um, their like feelings or their style of writing, even if I don't like it. Um, and then I don't want that to like permeate into my writing. So really, I think to get around this fact of like, I am learning how to build my boundaries better, but also to get around it, I try to limit like what I consume because I know it's a lot harder to purge than to take in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's part of why I wanted to ask about how you would describe the sort of genre that you're writing, because on the one hand, like lots of people write like memoir type pieces and lots of people write like reflective things about wisdom that they've learned from their lives. And uh, on the one hand, it's like kind of common, but you really have a very distinctive flavor of, of presenting your life story and the wisdom that you've learned and things like that, that feels very much your own. And, um, you know, I can sort of describe it from afar from having read your pieces, but I was just curious to hear how you would describe it and uh, how you sort of make sense of the kinds of things that you found yourself writing. Yeah. Um, so are you asking me to describe it more or are you? Um, oh, that's just a statement. Um, yeah, just okay. reflecting uh yeah sort no, of where I this is that. coming from yeah totally. um hmm. yeah i i, I want to talk a little bit more about this in some depth but maybe just quickly i'd be 
interested in hearing if there are any other genres that you could imagine yourself exploring in the future that you might like to try writing something like totally different. Yeah. So to be perfectly honest, I don't feel like I've gotten the fill of this genre mm -hmm. yet. I've, I, I've, I haven't, I feel like I have a lot more to say here. Um, and I don't know. Uh, fiction seems interesting. Although like whenever I go down, whenever it gets down to it and I try to write, I don't think I've ever, fiction has never really come out of me. So maybe I just like reading it. Um, maybe as I change, like over time, I'll find that fiction is easier for me to write. Um, but right now I really just uh, want to write about my experience. And also I think I, like I'm very driven and very curious and very hungry for a lot of new experiences. So I don't imagine that I'll run out of that anytime soon. Like it's only gonna get bigger and more intense and more interesting and explore different facets. And I feel like I'll always have um, things to talk about in this space. And yeah, I don't know, but never say never, we'll yeah. see. Yes. I think one thing that you seem to be doing as well in your writing is, uh, sort of reflecting on your life experiences in order to like discern wisdom from it and put articulate the wisdom that you've found. And I'm curious if you could speak to what the process of learning wisdom from your experience is. Um, so just crying, a lot of crying, just like, um, yeah, uh, it's very um, cathartic to, be able to like write it and also so it's like a few things so first of all like putting stuff down like bringing it out of your head out in the open takes a lot of its power away um and so if something feels really intense and scary and like you can't control it or you're ashamed of it then if you write about it or express it in some way it um really you're really then able to see it from an outside perspective and you'll see that it isn't as scary as you perhaps thought it was um and so that's like a big part of the learned wisdom it's just like the things that have power over you that are like controlling you in some way if you are able to change that narrative a little bit um, by expressing them, then go for it. Um, and, and also I think I'm just trying to live a very intentional life. Like, I think like a long time ago, I, I used to think that that meant, um, being very specific about your goals, like what, like, where do you want to live or what job do you want to have? And, um, that kind of thing. But now I think it means, uh, it means like being, being very, being like being very present with who you are. So I'm trying to be really intentional about like who I am and who I want to be. And, and I think that a side effect of that is that I'll get to where I want to go. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of the wisdom is, is definitely like around, I mean, a lot of the questions that I ask uh, at the start of a piece that hopefully get answered, at least for me, they do by the end of a piece is like around like who I am and who I wanna be and what does this mean for me? And does this align with my values and uh, being very intentional about creating myself instead and instead of like being very intentional about creating an, out an outcome. And uh, yeah, so that is a lot of a uh, big part of the wisdom is like, basically if you have the process and the person and the balance in place, then it's, then it's inevitable that the outcome will happen. Um, and also you're just a lot happier. I just found that I was just a lot happier. Um, also, right, a big part of the wisdom also pursuit of happiness. Um, what makes me happy and it's like a real balance because like I said 
I really do want to achieve a lot of things, but also, and so I can't let go of that completely, but I also don't want to be miserable until I get there. And so um, what's the optimal way of being happy, but also pursuing my life goals and uh, executing that. And then, um, and then, yeah. And, um, and uh, another big part of it is like learning to be kind to yourself and to other people. Um, so, uh, yeah, like in a lot of my writing, like I said, when I do this stream of consciousness, like multiple parts of me talking, like as dialogue in the movie, I uh, often found that there are parts of me that are mad at other parts or ashamed of them or embarrassed or like just disgusted by them and it's like wow like all right like where is that coming from like is that coming from a place of fear or usually it is um but yeah just like uh reworking that into but that's okay and I still love you because you're human um and I think a lot of what I found is when I've been able to love like different parts of myself, I've been able to find and love those parts in other people, like and appreciate those qualities about other, about other people. Um, yeah. Yeah. So a lot of the wisdom is just around. Um, yeah, like living a good life. Mm. And what does that mean for you? Like, what does that mean for me? Like, how, how do I do that? Well, is there any advice that you'd give someone who wanted to go through this process of trying to discern wisdom from their experience? Yeah. Um, so I think the best advice is that you're the only expert. You're the world's foremost expert on yourself. So trust your intuition. Um, and you know what's right for you. And do it at your own pace do it however feels right for you. Like, yeah, just like choose um, the things that work for you. Like you, you know best. Mm -hmm. One of the themes from your writing that I wanted to talk about is uh, boundaries. And there's a few questions I wanted to ask about this. And um, in one of your pieces, you describe, I think this was the center of the maze. Um, you talked about like sort of hearing other people saying that boundaries are selfish and then eventually you realize that they're necessary and what what sort of brought about that realization that boundaries are necessary yeah so so there's like a few different definitions of boundaries that I've heard over time that have like really resonated with me and so one of them is that it's it's letting boundaries just means letting other people know what's okay and what's not okay um that's really it. Like you're just, you're just, you're a unique person that um, has ideas and ways of living based on your experience. And um, that like those differences, like the differences from other people, that's what makes you you. And boundaries is just a way of letting other people know who you are and what that is for you. And um, it's, and also it's like a way of protecting yourself and other people um, from overstepping. And boundaries are really like, uh, boundaries are really like essential to relationships. And I'll, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in a second. But so uh, I think I mentioned a little bit ago that like growing up, I didn't really, uh, good boundaries weren't really modeled for me and so I didn't have a very good way of knowing like what a healthy boundary is and uh so that really like skewed my sense of my sense of boundaries and also I think it just having that experience really I think curbs your self-esteem and self-development because you don't because you're like too intertwined with other people to really know who you are 
uh, like for me that was true and um and like other people in that dynamic would like it to be that way um and because not not everybody else in the dynamic like in my family of origin like not all of the people were children like it was just i was the kid and other people were adults and so other people in that dynamic uh were more aware of the choices that they were making and they wanted um to have like a looser sense of boundaries um with their children which really um affected me and they their perspective was that having more boundaries than what they did was bad or having more boundaries means that you're selfish and that you're um, um self-centered or self-possessed or not really caring or loving or nurturing and uh for a long time because i and it's like a vicious cycle because it's for a long time because i had poor boundaries i would really take their experience and 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 like uh map it onto my own life and be like okay well if i have boundaries that means i'm selfish and um when really that wasn't true like and it took a lot of courage to even just try to experiment a different way of life just try to even uh be curious about like what it is like if you do have better boundaries or different boundaries um and see how that feels um and um really like when i got connected with my body again like when when i really felt um closer to myself again it i had a much better like finger on the pulse of what what does this make me feel like it so i was able to try out having more boundaries or less boundaries and then see as an experiment does that make me feel good or not and because i cared about myself because i'd done all this work with the writing and being kind to myself and accepting all the different parts of me i was like okay well this is important to make myself feel good to be uh really present uh in my life and do things that the like my adult uh can do to take care of my inner child and it doesn't make her feel good to have these boundaries and if yes then let's do that um and so yeah so changing so going from being scared of setting boundaries or thinking that boundaries are bad to um setting to like uh being more aware of how having boundaries makes me feel um was like a really difficult process and uh and it and re and like when i did it it totally made it it like totally made me see that having more boundaries or basically made me learn like what boundaries i like and um another way of thinking about boundaries that i really appreciate is that um it means that you're setting people up for success like if you have boundaries in relationships those relationships will be more successful because you're letting the other person know what is okay and what isn't okay with you so they know what to do and so then they will offend you less or they as far as they can i mean uh of course they're still human but they won't unintentionally overstep the mark when it comes to you because they know because you've told them you've made it clear and it's safer and calmer um for both people in the relationship and so you're really setting your relationship up for success if you um have good boundaries and yeah mm -hmm. in that same piece you talked about boundaries in terms of uh concentric circles and you said there's your innermost circle which is mostly just you there's close friends and then everyone else and um I want to ask a couple of things about that but maybe just to start like how did you start to think that way um, so i think i was also reading another douglas hofstadter book um around that time and he talks a lot about like um like loops and infinite loops and recursion and basically things being inside other things and 
like a smaller and smaller, smaller version of things like Russian dolls. And um, yeah, so I don't know. I feel like it must have come from that. But I, um, one thing that really helped me when like learning about boundaries is to like really think of it as like a physical boundary. Like imagine that you're sort of sitting in a bubble. Uh, it's like a permeable membrane and um, you can see everything outside of it, but nothing can come in and touch you without your permission. And it's just like a little mini exercise that I started doing sometimes with before I had conversations with people that I knew were triggering to me. Uh, and so I would just like sit for five minutes and imagine that I'm in just this little bubble and nothing can come inside without me, without my explicit permission. And so, and so like when I'm having a conversation with that person and they're trying to like poke at my boundary, I'm just like protected and safe inside this space. And so I really like that idea. And so I think I extended it a little bit to be like, well, you can have like more and more permeal membranes like uh, that extend further out that include uh, more or less people. And it really is like an exercise that you do constantly. Um, it There isn't ever like one and done, okay, these people are inside my boundary and then these people are outside forever. Like it's always changing. Like you're changing, they're changing, the circumstances are changing. And, um, uh, but yeah, I think that's sort of how I came up with it, with this exercise and a combination of sort of reading something uh, around loops hmm. um, around that time. And what does that look like in practice for you? Like, are there any examples of like how those different layers affect how you think about interactions? Yeah, totally. So it, it affects a lot of things. It affects like my comfort level and the time. Um, and it affects like um, uh, uh, the giving of information. So for example, if I get a text from someone and I know that they have a tendency to like push on my boundaries a lot, then I don't reply right away because um, I decide when is good for me to get back to them. Like it's not, I'm not under under pressure to like reply right away. And of course I'm not talking about situations when it's like urgent or important, but like just normal day-to-day -day life. Uh, so, the, so the time of response is, is like varied um, between people that I um, know respect my boundaries and people that I know have a tendency to push on it a lot. Um, and then, um in terms of sharing of information like if you there's definitely more things that i keep to myself now and um and i feel okay about that and that has really come with time that has really come with time and practice because if you're just an open book all the time with everybody including people that have a tendency to use that information for their own purposes. And this is totally might not be intentional. Um, it just might be what they have learned or what they do, but that's that's like not, that doesn't mean that when they do that, it doesn't hurt you. And so if it hurts you, then what can you do to protect yourself? Well, you can uh, start to filter out a little bit like what you say or how much you, how much you say. Um, and then also like in terms of how much you explain yourself, like being overly apologetic or being overly, um, overly present uh, or like, and, or just like, uh, yeah, it that just affects like your self esteem and if and affects like the power dynamic in the relationship and it and you're sort of like constantly putting yourself in a position of like rolling over or um, being less powerful and it it like shapes how you think about yourself in relation to other people and so this like sharing of information is like a big one um, again like not completely figured it out with everybody like everything is an experiment constantly testing like what feels good what doesn't feel good okay right and then this is the third one is like um be really being in touch with my body so like um I've learned over time that 
there's like a lot of societal messaging that's like very primed to like just get into your brain and you think like if I mean I think in words I, I I don't know that everybody does but I definitely think in words and so a lot of the thoughts that I think I, I used to just like trust everything that was in my brain like I used to just trust like every single thing that ever came up and um now I've slowly learned that maybe no like maybe that's not true like uh it's it's okay to um not basically not immediately believe every thought that comes up because it might not be true and um really like check in constantly with how you feel like how does your body feel do you feel stressed anywhere and then like over time like you start to learn what parts of your body like neck and upper shoulders like whatever it gets starts to get stressed um when things are triggering for you and then that's like a quick way to tell like somebody's pushing on my boundaries like something's happening here and that's when like the permeable membrane um exercise helps as well because it like completely surrounds you and you're just like fully protected in there and so um if they're pushing on it then you know like even if you don't have language to tell them to back off even if you don't know how to like gently push them away um you will at least be able to tell that it's like not comfortable for you and um and i kind of want to say something interesting here is that earlier i um we when we were talking about the writing uh one piece of advice that i gave was like listen to your intuition and like listen to what your inner voice is telling you all the time and now i'm sort of saying like um uh that don't trust everything that your brain is telling you so this is really interesting um rule of like equal and opposite advice and so you know what's right for you you know what advice you need to hear um and even though it's like different contexts it i just want to bring it up because it's interesting to me um that's another thing with boundaries is like because i'm an expert on myself like nobody has as much context on me as i do and so i know what's good for me in this situation what that like that thing might not translate to a different situation um even if other people think that it works for them or if it translates for them and so if if like anybody listening is um has ever been confused about this like i have um humans are really complicated and remember the rule of equal and opposite advice mm one of the um uh really memorable sort of story arcs in your uh pieces is about your relationship with your parents and how things changed there and uh you know in the end you sort of set from what i can tell from reading it you set very strong boundaries with your parents and i'd be curious to hear you describe when it makes sense to set really strong boundaries with someone yeah so well the short answer is when it feels right Mm -hmm. um uh but it's this is like one of the pieces that's really interesting that i have haven't heard that many people talk about like many people like i i found a lot of videos on youtube talking about the mechanics of set, setting boundaries like what language do you use like how do you um how do you and we can like link this uh in the description if someone is interested but uh these videos that i'm talking about but uh yeah mechanics of setting boundaries like what does it mean like how do you think about boundaries but then actually doing it in practice is like really hard cuz a lot of stuff comes up cuz none of this is like unrelated it's all like feeds into each other and is built on top of each other and is really intertwined and um so a lot of stuff comes up in practice and so it's it's um really uh difficult because you have to be honest with yourself about about what is happening like like what what is the reality of what you're experiencing like do you actually like it or do you not like it and if you and if you're and for me for example i have a lot of ability to take the tr- like take in the truth even if it's uncomfortable for me um and and you know like you're an expert on yourself so you know if that's not you and so then you approach it slowly 
um, you don't just let it all rush in because then you won't be able to take in. You'll feel you'll start to get detached. You'll you'll get overwhelmed. Like you don't want that for yourself. Like you really want this to be like an experience that um, is going to be hard but possible. Um, and so, um, yeah. So setting boundaries, like um, think like thinking about setting boundaries or setting strong boundaries with people. Um, it doesn't have to be like all in one go or all today. Well, first of all, you don't have to have all the answers now. Um, you don't, you can like really, really slow things down and you can totally change your mind at any point for any reason. So those things are really just important to know going in. And then um, you can like, like I was talking about before, you can experiment. Like what is, uh, what works for you? So you can, start with this like permeable membrane thing like you can um before you talk to someone like you know that you don't have to respond to them immediately and then before you talk to them you try to imagine that you're in a protected cocoon of your own making and um nothing can hurt you in here and really just try to like feel it and be in it and then talk to the person and then if that really still pushes on your boundary then maybe you need to think about like okay, what am I comfortable with? Do I want to say something? Well, then also, like, do you want to keep this relationship around? Because if you do, then you need to let them know what's comfortable for you. Because if you don't, then they're just constantly going to keep pushing. Um, and then um, if you do let them know, like, if suppose you do decide to say something um, about, like, one small part, uh, and um, you do let them know, that something is going to be different. They might not like it. And because people in general like things to stay the same. And so they'll notice that you're changing something and they might not like it and they might try to push back. And then you need to remember that you are doing this for a reason, like you're setting boundaries very intentionally. And and if if they push back and you break, then they'll learn that they can push and you can you'll break. Um, and so uh, that's like another thing to try is like maybe like try to talk to them and then expect some pushback but then remember to stay like consistent and firm and then also I would just say like make a lot of uh, space in your life to do this like this might take up a lot of time and mental energy and like bring up a lot of stuff that you might need to process and um yeah, be kind to yourself and be patient. And um, and and there's more. So um, if you're and so another like really hard part about this is that you have to be prepared for whatever comes. Like if you try to change boundaries with people, if you try to like talk to them and if you try to, and if they try to push back and then you try to talk to them some more and then they keep pushing back and it turns out that they have a limitation that and they're not really able to change, then you need to be like prepared to maybe attach consequences and you need to be like, all right, you know, uh, whenever you say this thing to me, it really hurts me. and I'll, and the next time you say it, I'll point it out. And if you are unable to stop, then I won't share this part of my life with you anymore. Then, you know, you need to attach consequences. And then if still it doesn't work, then, then you can like do, then you can think about if you like want to walk away or um, like if you want to, cut them out to what extent like uh really like all of this is very malleable but um um I think through all of this it's important to just like be really honest with yourself like how does it actually make like regardless of what you want this person in your life to be um like when you actually look at them are they that like are they um as nice to you as you thought they were? Are they as respectful of you and your time and your energy as you thought they were? And if not, what does that mean? Does that mean that you are gonna constantly um, 
do you, do you still want to like keep this relationship the way it is? And and it's not always just boundaries doesn't always mean like keep a relationship or cut it out. It really there's like so many steps. Like I said, it's like it's like uh, you, you you can like vary stuff with time and the information that you provide and like you can be like direct about it or um, or you can not be direct and you can like um, you can just like choose to slowly withdraw and there's like so much stuff that you can do and like play with really experiment and see like what feels good for you um but it's really important to be really honest about that like you're doing this for yourself and if you don't feel good then then that isn't the right thing no matter what other people say and um, I sort of want to bring up like this. Um, I sort of want to bring up this uh, quote that I really like, and it's called um, um, and it's called the Litany of Gendlin. Um And I have it written down, so let me look for it, and I'll read it out. Um, Okay, so what is true is already so, owning up to it does not make it worse. Not being open about it doesn't make it go away. And because it's true, it's what's there to be interacted with. Anything untrue isn't there to be lived. People can stand what is true for they are already enduring it. And I love that. It really got me through a lot of difficult times because especially the last part, you can stand what it's true, what is true because you're already enduring it. Like you're already doing it. You're already alive and in it and experiencing it and look at how well you've done so far. And so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I'd like to ask another question about this, but it feels uh, I want to like ask in a careful way. So let me see how to feel into this. Uh, Just to begin, you know, I said earlier about reading your writing about how impactful it is because it's like I haven't been through these experiences. And so when I read about uh, your interactions with your parents and I was just like, yeah, I haven't been through that. And, you know, I've had my own relationship with my parents with all of its joys and difficulties, but uh, definitely not the same. And so, um, and uh if I understood it correctly from the way you described it, it was not that you cut your parents out of your life, but that you sort of really fundamentally changed how you saw them and therefore how you interacted with them and like not letting them have sort of authority over you anymore. And then maybe like decreasing the amount that you talk to them or like the ways in which you talk to them, like changing the the way you showed up for those interactions. Uh, well, for, first off, is that is that a fair description of it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, what, so I'm asking you, this, this is often the case I'm realizing on the show, but so I'm, I'm asking you a question about your personal experience, but it's also like for someone that might be in a similar situation of like, what do you wish you had known about setting those boundaries before you decided to do that? Or as you were going through that process? Um, nothing I think there are a lot of times that I've been really hard on myself for 
uh, being the person that I was. Like, why weren't you better? Why didn't you try harder? Why didn't you know more? Why didn't you try this thing, try to do this thing differently? Um, and I'm sort of now in a place where I really love all the things that I chose. I feel like I did the best that I could with the information that I had at the time. And, and I honestly really appreciate all the things that I chose because it got me to where I am now. And I really like that place. And this is a very weird thing that happened. And this sort of conclusion happened on its own um, when I accepted, remember like early on in this conversation, we were talking about, um, uh, I was telling you about how like I have a lot of goals and a lot of dreams and um, instead of trying to like directly achieve them or like waiting to be happy until I achieve them, I sort of started to find ways in my life that I could be happy now while also putting in a lot of effort into things that I cared about. And then really trusting that like, if I trust my intuition and if I do what feels right and what I find to be the best possible path from all the options that I have available, um, that I'll, that like getting to where I want to go is just going to be like a side effect of, of, um, of all of this work. And I sort of think that that's what my past self was trying to do. Like that's what little me was trying to do. And I think she did it. Like getting to where I am was honestly just a side effect because she was the whole time just focused on herself and her experience and what she thinks and without even really trying. Um, and so um, just like realizing that about my current self allowed me to love my past self in the same way or realizing that about my current self like showed me that my past self was also doing the same thing and it got me to where I am now and um so another way that I like to describe this is like for a long time I had this like savior complex because I thought I had a hard childhood and I did um, but I, I had pretty traumatic childhood. Um, and so I wanted to save anybody else from ever going through that again. And because I thought that I couldn't save myself. So let me at least try to save other people. And just like a little while ago, I sort of realized that I did save myself because like my life now is really amazing. And like she built that, like my past self built that. Um, and, and I think that she did all the, all the things that felt right for her at the time. And so what my wish for her is like what I'm already doing for her is to like give her that trust and respect that she didn't really get from around, from anybody else around her at the time. Like when she was going through all those experiences, like nobody was saying you're doing the right thing. You're in the right place. Trust yourself. But I'm saying that now and it just makes me feel good that I'm able to like save that little girl in this way. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to sit with that for a second. Yeah, I notice uh, recalling the experience of reading those essays uh, that for me, it was like, I, I, I wish that you didn't have to go through the things that you went through and wishing that you could have learned some of the lessons that you learned in a less extreme way. And uh, you know, maybe that's, I, I don't know, I feel a little uh, uh, like maybe that's a disrespectful thing to say or something, especially when you just said no. what you said, but, and I'm also noticing that that comes from a place of, um, holding some of the things in my own life of wishing that I wish having that attitude towards it myself. And, um, that feels sort of sad to notice 
in this moment. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I love how you see it. And then also just noticing that like in my body and in my life, like the actual way I hold it is very different. Yeah. Yeah, it is very sad, extremely sad, but it's also very beautiful. Like, I mean, I'm just really proud of that little girl and of little Tashin because they made it look at where you are now they made it out mm -hmm. and they made it and they learned so many lessons along the way and they became really beautiful people and and the sadness is what makes it so profound it yeah you can't take them out of each other but then together they form something more beautiful like that movie inside out mm. towards the end uh, the protagonist learns that the moment was so special the happy memory was so special because in contrast to or like because of the sad memories that came before it that made the happy memory like that elevated it and mm -hmm. i love that about life it's so romantic and nostalgic and real and it really makes you glad to be human glad mm. to be because you were a part of something and it was hard and that changed you and you embraced it and now you're better for it mm. yeah i noticed that in this moment uh it's very easy for me to feel proud of you and uh, admire a lot of courage that I think you have. And uh, that's really sweet to notice. And also, uh, I don't think I'm at a point where I uh, feel proud of myself in quite the same way. Like there's plenty of ways that I am proud of myself, but not in this specific flavor. And I think that will be something useful for me to sit with, of like putting on the frame that you're talking about and looking at my life that way. And yeah, I'm going to think about that. Yeah. I am very proud of you. I'm, I remember we had a conversation once where you said, I wish you could see me. I wish you could see yourself as I see you now. And mm. I wish you could see yourself <laughs> as I see you now. <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> that would be nice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's funny. That's funny because I often feel that as you, I mean, that's why I said it to you, but I often feel that about people. And uh, yeah, I think I'd actually, you know, that's, that's something that I yearn for a lot of the times is like, sometimes I get flashes of uh, what I might be like in the future. And I get this sort of sense of a, a very wise, loving, kind, strong person. That's like this, you know, like, elderly man that's like very grounded and calm and uh I made a piece of art a while back to like symbolize this to myself and uh, I get flashes of that and it's like oh I would really like to like receive that specific thing it's like the same thing that I give to other people but uh one to myself and also like in this sort of like uh uh oh I don't know how like I forget the word for it but like how wine sort of uh grows in strength over time and it's With like age yeah 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 um yeah i love that idea i love that i mean to start with other than the elderly part i see you as all those things now mm -hmm. and i love the idea of um you said that you make art for other people you, you can make that for yourself mm -hmm. like dedicate it to your past self um, mm. I recently changed my Twitter bio to be this. Like I said, that I write love letters to my inner child. Mm. And there you go. Like mm. that. Yeah. Little passion needs. Mm. 
Yeah, it's very clear hearing you talk about this. There's like a specific medicine I could give myself that would be good to do. So that you you seem to have taken the dose in full. So I appreciate you demonstrating that and I'll be uh, sitting Happy with that. To. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, another question I wanted to ask you about, there was this, there was this line that really stuck out stuck out to me where you were quoting a, a book, the Expanse book, Nemesis Games. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you said he couldn't help but feel like humanity kept learning the, the wrong lessons from its traumas. And then you said the cycle will not be broken unless we learn the right ones. Um, and I, that just made me want to ask, like, well, what, what are the right lessons to learn from our trauma? Um, your, your own responsibility. That is like the biggest lesson that I've learned is that however sad it was that however sad my experiences were however whoever they made me into if I want to be different it's on me and that's the best thing I could do taking responsibility for myself the best thing I could do for myself and for other people um, and a lot, I think, because, you know, from my person, just, this is just my experience is that a lot of things that my trauma tried to teach me is just like fix other people, like change other people, um, or, or change yourself to please other people. But it was always like, uh, there was no line there's no separation between myself and someone else and really blossoming into an individual is is your own responsibility and and nothing has to change for like nobody else has to change for that to happen for yourself like for you to have cathartic releases and process your own feelings and even like find closure with people that have hurt you you can all do that within yourself because it's in the end it's sort of not really about them it's about you and um this is this was really interesting because one of the essays that i wrote called reborn that was the second one that i wrote um i really like at that time i was feeling extremely sad and overwhelmed by all of the of just like like living like reliving my past memories and the only person that I wanted to talk to about all of this was my mom who was present in all of those past interactions that had been so hurtful for me and so it was such a paradox that I wanted to talk to my mom about how she hurt me and um uh and Instead, I just did a lot of work by myself, like, uh, because at the time I was also accepting the reality of like, maybe um, this other person is limited in this way and they won't be able to provide the closure that I need. And so I need to provide that for myself. And uh, that's the lesson that you learn that I think is like the right lesson to learn from your trauma is just to take responsibility for your life and for yourself and um and total that can like definitely extend out to the world like the things that you do um can can enhance the world and change it but it starts with it's it's it starts with like it starts on the inside um changing the outside saving all those other people from their sad fate, like I thought I needed to do, um, was never going to save me. But saving myself has now given me the power to go out and try to, well, not save, but change other people's lives. Um, It makes me think about um, 
forgiveness and specific situations I've been in where I've had some kind of difficulty with someone and I found it historically on the one hand difficult to forgive people without that kind of interpersonal processing and then on the other hand like so much easier if uh, you can really honestly share with someone hey this is the impact that you had on me and have them receive it and acknowledge it and respond authentically and um, yeah and yet life does present situations where you can't have that available to you and you're saying yeah. oh it is possible to kind of do that for yourself and give yourself that and I wonder if you could speak some more to what makes that possible to uh, come to closure for yourself, even if you can't have that kind of interaction with the person that may have hurt you. Yeah, so for me, um, there's like two different versions of the person. Um, one version is the real them that's out there in the world that's living their life. And one version, oh, here's my dog. My friend. <laughs> Hi, Poppy. Um, and one version is um, the version of them that's living in my head, the um, image of them that I have learned from my interactions with them. And uh, I sort of did a lot of processing with the person that was in my head. Like I, um, and, and I don't know how to describe this, but let me try. So the person that's in my head, the image of, uh, the, image of um, the person in, out there in the real world, it's still me. It's still a part of me projecting them, projecting their voice. Like I hear their voice in my head and I know what they would say in this situation. And it, it's all still me. It's all like, some part of my subconscious is creating that. And they can still be out there in the real world doing whatever they're doing. But if I resolve the inner conflict, the interpersonal conflict between them in my subconscious and myself, then it will bring me a lot more inner peace regardless of their actions regardless of whether or not they change. Of course, it would be amazing if I was able to have a conversation with them and, and explain my boundaries and they were able to receive it and be loving. And then our relationship in the real world would change. But this like sense of stability and relaxation and acceptance comes from really changing the relationship between the two people that both live in my brain. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So did you have sort of imaginary conversations with your mother in that case or in other similar time. cases? Yeah. 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 All the time. Yeah. A lot of imaginary conversations. And then a lot of like imaginary conversations. So a lot of work that I did was really interesting because me, the adult, went back in time um, into memories of me, the child, where she was feeling hurt. So it's little me and parents, and then now adult me going back in time and sort of protecting little me and being like, you go play, I'm going to be in this situation. And it's like a huge, like, um, it was like a huge shift in how I, in how those memories like sat inside my body and how they like affected my nervous system uh, because I was able to see that like it was not my fault because I was a child had I been an adult had I had all the adult capacity and strength and knowledge that I do now I would not have processed that situation in that way I wouldn't have perceived that situation in the way that child me did um, and so yeah, so definitely having conversations like between the two people in my head, but also like really going back in time as me and seeing that situation for like what it was. Because you know, many memories that you have, like as a kid, you just remember like a really tall person yelling at you because um, you were small and they were really big and they had a lot of power and authority over you, but 
that's not true anymore. And so just really being aware of that was very, uh, and I mean, I'm doing this exercise of trying to go back into my memory as me helped me to be aware of that. It's like, wait, and, and, and whenever I got triggered and started to feel scared, um, I, would, I, I would remind myself, like, I'm not that little child anymore. <laughs> um, I, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not in that situation anymore. I'm not a little child anymore. Come back, come back to here. Like notice where you are now, like grounding exercises are helpful for this. Like, <laughs> really want to be part of the podcast. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, yeah. So for example, like a, like a, uh, something that really helped me um come back to the now is like uh, uh, filling up a bowl with uh uh ice water and then putting your face in it and for however long you can feel comfortable and then come out and take a few breaths and then go back in and then just do that a few times and that really <sighs> sends a signal to your body that uh, there's like less oxygen available to it. So like interrupt this like hyperventilating panic mode and uh, come back to the present. Like it just pulls you back right away. Um, and so that's like a good like grounding exercise and uh, doing that just sort of like interrupted that like sort of mental um, uh, <laughs> like cycle of like, uh oh, I'm a little child, I'm getting yelled at, uh oh, this is like super stressful, I don't have any power in the situation, like, and you just cut, just cut that right in the middle. And then you imagine yourself as an adult going back and being there and being like, hey, actually, this isn't so stressful for me. Like, you know, it was only stressful because I was a kid. And so it isn't my fault. Like, I didn't do anything wrong here. Um, uh, yeah, so those things definitely help, like changing the experience around. Um, and then a lot of conversations between me and little me, uh, just even just writing them down. A lot of like, uh, because so basically I wasn't able to get my needs met from my external family of origin. Like I wasn't able to get my, um, as a child, I wasn't able to get the things that I needed, like love and acceptance and like emotional, uh, like an emotional cuddle. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was able to give that my adult self was able, but I'm like currently like a full adult and I can totally do that for other people, for my dog. Um, so why not for my own past self? Mm -hmm. And so that really like that bonding really like heals a lot of wounds. Um, and um in general, like another thing that just this just made me think of that I also do is like whenever I make a mistake or a thing that I feel like is a mistake, I always think about reacting to it as if I would react to as if I would react like a five year old child made this mistake, this child that I adore. Like if I love if I'm in love with the kid and they made a mistake, what, what would you say? And like sort of extending that to your own self. Mm. Um, mm. And that's so sweet. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So that really helped close a lot of these loops that I thought were open that like other people like needed to needed to close. And yeah, they you're right, they do in like the real world, but within yourself, you don't need that. Hmm. Yeah, I'm having just this sort of amazement. Uh, and I've had this before, but it just feels really strong right now. Like, it's kind of amazing that any of this stuff works to heal things and like can really does have these sort of profound shifts for processing difficult experiences and totally like, non-obvious that that would work, but it does work, you know? Yeah, yeah. I share, I share that sense of amazement completely. And I, and it just, and I didn't really believe in it till I tried it and it worked for me. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> very powerful. Mm. Yeah, I'm getting this sense now also of like when you this this is just a sort of sense from afar and I don't know if it's actually like this for you but like I can imagine that when you write your pieces that there's some sort of like 
issue in life that you're really chewing on and like trying to make sense of and that like by the time you hit publish like you really do have a sensibility around it and like it's become clear to you and you're like oh yeah I've got that worked out now and almost yeah. like an upgrade or something like oh I've I've sorted that out you know yeah 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 and I mean to be honest I spend a lot of time on it like mm -hmm. I mean I just like when I start writing something and until I actually hit publish like I'm thinking about it the whole time mm -hmm. and it really is at the forefront of my mind and it's like mostly like I think about all my experiences in relation to it and it's very much like a lot of mental effort um which I enjoy like I do really like going deep into things and so it's really um yeah I'm like very present with it and and, and chewing on it the whole time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really get that sense from afar and from hearing you talk about it. And it's, that's part of why I was curious to ask about your writing process, just because, uh, yeah, it really seems like for the time that uh, you're working on an essay, like that's your baby and you're just taking care of it. And then it's it's alive and here we go. Yeah, yeah. it's out there. Um, it's it's beautiful that you share these pieces. I think they're, they're real you. gifts. So thank you for writing them. Yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Well, uh, we've covered a lot of territory. I wonder, is there anything else that you'd like to talk more about or say more about? Um, so we talked a lot about boundaries and about writing. Um, I'm like happy to talk about um, the latest essay that I wrote as well, if mm. that's something that you're interested in hearing about. Sure. So um, that was like a big one. That was like a very profound, intense like change. Um, and it was called How to Lose. And the main idea was that um, until you learn how to lose other people's games, you can't really start playing your own. And that's been a big, big like learning experience in my life because I really felt like before, in many parts, um, before I wrote that essay, before I really processed that for myself, I was living, I, I was living under other people's power. Like I was being driven. I, I had a lot of my own core drive and interests but I think I was letting those be overshadowed by other people and whenever I saw people that were not doing that uh whenever I saw people that were like happy with their current circumstances and just like thriving in them I would feel um the sense that that was like missing from my life um and really like it took a lot of like examining my relationship with with boundaries and then with also with um, like, why am I doing what I'm doing? Uh, and it almost felt like I was sort of apologizing for existing. Like I, I, I was like, I was like, oops, I'm sorry that I'm here and I'm sorry that I'm so much and I'm sorry that I have so much to say and so much that I wanna be and and it felt like I was asking permission from my haters to be my own self. And um, because it felt like if I didn't do any of that, it felt like if I, um, if basically it felt like other people had more power over my life than I did. And and if I didn't like apologize all the time or, or, or try to, assuage other people's feelings then I would get like they would come for me and I would get hurt and really I think this last year and two years has been sort of like one long experiment in trying to like test that theory and be like is that really true if I really express myself is anyone really going to come for me um and um if they do will I not be able to handle it and um I just and because you know, the premise of the essay is that, is that if, um, if you do reject other people's ideas, then they're gonna uh, frame it in a way that 
you are not strong enough to live in their world and so you lost you're not strong enough to play their game so you lost their game and it's like oh all right like what if i do lose your game like does that really affect me like this do, do i really feel bad about it does that really change anything in my life um or does it make it better does it make me grow does it make me happier does it does it make does it make more time and space to care about the things that I want to put energy into things that I want and um uh so far the experiment has really shown me that none of the things that I was afraid of were real they were just like monsters under my bed and once they sort of came out you're like oh this is a really tiny toy that was casting a really large shadow <laughs> and uh yeah I just want to say if you're afraid of something, try it, try, like if you're afraid of doing something, just try it once. And um, you can always go back to the way you were doing it before. If it doesn't work out, really not a big deal. You can always go back, but if your experiment succeeds, like you're gonna be a lot more free and a lot more happy. Mm. What were the games that you had to become willing to lose at that were other people's games? and? Also, what is the game? What's your game that you decided to win at or try to win at? Uh, drama, other people's games, is like drama about not being explicit about boundaries. So, like uh, where I come from, the culture that I grew up in is very like um, indirect, passive aggressive. Like, I'm going to show you things, uh, like, I'm going to do gestures to make you feel things and it's like it takes so much mental energy to parse other people's gestures and to learn like how they um how they what they like and what you can do to please them and I much prefer to just be very direct and open and clear because then it's like easier for everybody in the relationship like you're never in doubt about whether I'm mad at you or not because if I am I'll tell you like you'll know so you don't have to be like on eggshells all the time and um this is a game that other people around me weren't willing to play. And if that means that they become a less important presence in my life, then all right. And if they think that I'm losing out, then all right, you know, because I don't think so. And that's what's really important. Um, and uh, for the second part of the question, so the, these are the games that I was just like willing to lose with other people. And then for the second part of the question, um, the games that I care about is just, it's just really fulfilling what I believe to be my purpose. And, oh, this is something that actually good place to mention. So I'm very empathetic as a person, uh, like an empath and, so I'm very good at intuiting what other people need from me because I've had to get good at that uh, from life experience. So um, I'm always constantly aware of like what other people need from me. And, and uh, for a long time, like I would just give that to them. Uh, I, I would put their needs above my own and I would just give that to them. Um, but I personally believe that fulfilling my own needs as um, in terms of definitely like things that I need as a person to, to thrive and grow, but also things that I'm really curious about and like intellectually curious about or companies that I wanna build and projects that I wanna work on, just like being very self-indulgent um, is gonna work out really well for me and for the world. And, uh, because I can feel my own power. Like I, I can feel my own, uh, it's like a little rocket with uh, the boosters. And you know that they're top of the line, like really strong, powerful, and they can just like lift you up into, into space. And it's taken me a long time to say that because society really doesn't accept uh, um, there's like a lot of subliminal messaging in society that like women really shouldn't be this self-intelligent and like um you're 
like like my role as an empath was much more acceptable to society than it was um to me and funnily enough because i'm an empath i know that like i can feel it all the time uh and it's like i feel like my life is one big experiment in doing the thing that i said like doing things that scare me but really feel very true to me um and just sort of seeing how far it goes like what really is going to happen and i mean that's sort of the fun of it like what really is going to happen one way or another and one thing that a lot of this trauma and difficult experiences have done is like solidified for me that i can pull myself out of difficult situations and i can learn from them and i can grow from them and so if that is really the outcome like if i do get myself into difficult situations by experimenting and trying things out that i truly care about I'll be okay. Mm-hmm. It hadn't occurred to me before but I think that that description of uh becoming willing to lose at other people's games and deciding to win your own like uh describes in some way like uh my choice to leave monastic training and people ask me about that all the time and you know in some ways it's just like yeah like i it was time for me to move on but i think in a certain way i was like trying so hard to like play a game of like i'm going to get enlightened and be a really good monk and like help this organization and uh and then i was but that there was something about who i am and how i wanted to show up in the world that wasn't being fully manifest through that attempt and uh yeah and i think now i'm like yeah i'm playing my own game where i you know have podcast conversations and write and draw and uh you know spend a lot of time on twitter and hang out with friends all over the world it's like that's a very yes. different game than i was playing before but i'm i'm definitely winning at it so that's nice yeah that's so amazing i love that i love mm. that for you that's so that's so great i commend mm. you mm. yeah i really like looking at it with that frame it's very helpful uh i it hadn't occurred to me while reading the piece i was like oh yeah she like decided to lose other people's games and like is winning her own like good for you you know that's awesome like i there was a big like uh mudita blast of feeling happy for you and uh kind of seeing how that made sense in your life and um and but I hadn't sort of reflected on that in my own life until now so um there's also yeah that it occurs to me there's really um how to put this it was really nice to read through I I I read your essays multiple times but I sort of read through them all before this and it was nice to read them all because uh you know they they're definitely like largely standalone essays although you link between them but like there's there's a sort of whole to it that uh is like bigger than any one essay and it was nice to kind of see that and really um yeah. root for you and yeah, thank you you're, you're doing it so yeah I really appreciate that thank you mm. it makes me excited to you know you're saying earlier like oh there's you know I, like I, there's a lot more here and i want to keep going it's like yeah sign me up <laughs> i am signed up for the substack like i will get that email so yeah yes amazing yeah. yeah yeah anything else you'd like to share or talk more about no mm. it's always nice to leave things for another time mm. sounds good Sounds good. Well, thank you so much for speaking with me and also again for writing what you're putting out into the world and yeah, we'll stay tuned for more. Yeah, thank you for having me on. This was as always a lovely lovely conversation. Um I'm so proud of all the things that you're doing mm. for the world and I'm excited to watch what you do next. Same for both of us, friend. Thanks for saying that. Talk soon. Thank you too.